Welcome to the Anxiety at Work podcast. I'm Chester Elton, and this is my co-author and dear friend, Adrian Costa. We hope the time you spend with us is going to remove the stigma of anxiety and mental health in the workplace and your personal life. And we invite experts from around the world of work and life to give us ideas and tools to deal with anxiety in our world. And we want to thank our sponsor, Life Guides, a peer-to-peer community that helps people navigate through their day-to-day stressors by providing a place of empathy, listening, wisdom, and support with a guide who has walked in your shoes, experiencing the same challenge of life experience as you. So go to lifeguides.com forward slash schedule a demo and add the code HEALTHY2021 to receive two free months of service. Two free months. All you got to do is put HEALTHY2021 to the free text box and you get two months free. How great is that? It is great, and we also want to send a big thanks to our sponsor, Go Happy Hub, the most inclusive and timely way to communicate and engage directly with your frontline employees and candidates with 95% plus open rates. With Go Happy Hub, you can send text messages directly from corporate and enable permissions for your frontline leaders to communicate with their team. Whether they want to send notes of gratitude, logistical updates, referral opportunities, LTOs, new hire introductions, learning content, celebrations, and more. Easily get to the right message, to the right people, with simple segmentation by location, job type, language, etc. And you get feedback from the field in a structured, digestible, and actionable way. That's Go Happy Hub. Wonderful. Well, our guest today is our new friend, David McNeff. David founded Peak Consulting Group in 1995 to develop executive talent and bolster the performance of executive teams for companies all over the world. A CEO coach and trusted advisor, his clients include MetLife, Prudential, Vertex, and Biogen, among others. Dave has suffered from work-related and personal-related anxieties in his past and now uses that knowledge to help his client base and companies with these issues within their workforces. Dave's solutions are articulated in his wonderful book, The Work-Life Balance Myth. David, welcome to our humble podcast. We are delighted to have you here. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Well, again, thanks for joining us, David. Uh, first question. Now, in, in your great book and in other writings you've done, you write that we've never been more stressed, uh, you know, with all that's going on. So what exactly is it that you say that stressing is out so much? And, and, and I love that you talk about so many of us are turning, unfortunately, to negative coping devices. So talk a little bit about that. Set the stage for us. All right, good. So setting the stage is actually putting everything in context here. It's really important. So particularly in COVID, uh, pace of play in terms of where is the stress getting manufactured, it's the pace of play that's creating more workload. COVID has officially blurred the line between work and home because for a lot of people it's the same, even though the hybrid is starting to develop, which is also creating a new level of stress, oh, by the way, over the past two or three months. And uh, basically, it's the the workload, the people issues, the questioning of does this work well for me and relationship management at home and at work with that line being blurred has just quickened everything. So that everything that's been coming at you prior to COVID quickened. And this pressure, you know, to be efficient while being challenged to also be effective has created this anxiety level for an individual on Zoom to wonder, how well am I doing? So with this constant stress, what what I've noted, you know, even prior to COVID, what I've noted for years is, people would seek the the negative coping devices. And the coping devices I refer to are overeating, over-drinking, over-sexing, over-gambling, et cetera. You know, pick, you know, <laughs> under quotes, pick your poison. And so people would often ask, you know, later after they've gone through it, well, why did I do that? You know, why did I choose to overeat or whatever? And I'd say, you know, because you're a human being, an immediate gratification from anxiety is all of our goals. I mean, so if you 
ate a piece of cake, well, the stress went away for that three-minute period. And then it came rushing right back. So I think I'll have another piece of cake and so on and so on. And whether that's, you know, drinking or whatever. Uh, and we all have our, our issues and I'm no holier than anybody else. And so the book sprung out of this how to manage stress outside of that. So, okay, Dave, if you, you're so smart, how am I supposed to manage this stress in work and at home successfully? And so that's, uh, I used the seven slice method starting about, I don't know, 15 years ago with individual clients who were going through a tough time, which I write about in the book, and it happened to work for them. So their encouragement was, you really should write a book about this. And it, you know, it took me a long time to finally sit down and do it. And the trigger point was I gave a talk on it, you know, down in Nashville to 700 HR professionals. And I mentioned, you know, I think I'm probably going to write a book about this. And afterwards, the business editor from McGraw-Hill came up to me, who happened to be in the audience, and said, you know, if you write the book, we'd like you to submit it to us. <laughs> You know, literally, I said, well, okay. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of kicked this whole thing off. But, you know, going back to the stress thing, you know, it, it's stress is never going to stop. What's going to stop is how you handle it to either get, it's either going to get better or it's going to get worse. Yeah. And so I think COVID has brought every person that I've, been in touch with to ask that question. Yeah. Does this does this work for me? Uh, and if not, what am I going to do about it? Exactly. I think that second question is the, the most important one, right? What am I going to do about it? Because it's never yes. going to go away. You know, as you were listening, listing people's, you know, reactions, how do you solve the stress problem? And you went to uh, sex, drugs. I thought for sure you were going to go to rock and roll. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love rock and roll. I mean, yeah, you can't do a, too much rock and roll, Chess. Come exactly. On, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, that's the holy trinity, right? I do right. love your solution with cake, though. I agree. Cake, it really does relieve a lot of stress. And, oh, um, yeah. and, and again, <laughs> can you have too much cake? Well, uh, yeah. Marie Antoinette would say yes. Um, you know, you talked about your um, seven slices, you know, right. and this, this work by, uh, work play, work-life balance, easy for me to say. Work-life balance myth and so many companies that you've worked with. Uh, the thing is, you, you still have to hit your numbers. You still have to get stuff done, right? So you talk about this um, seven-slice method. Can you yes. take us through the seven slices? Yeah, and, and where the myth comes from is, is the, the principle of the seven slices. So most people think, well, I need work-life balance. Right. So because I'm thinking I only have two slices. I have work and I have family. Well, it turns out we have five other slices or lives, so I call them slices, of our life. And the other five are you have a personal life, a physical life, an emotional life, an intellectual life, and a spiritual life, which I call these seven slices. And I defined each slice in the book. And when I first did this years ago with people, they go, well, what's a personal life? I go, well, a personal life is something you do just for yourself. Now, it might include a member of your family or your whole family, but it doesn't have to. It's something you do for yourself in the form of a hobby, an avocation, <clears throat> a pursuit. But it's something you do for you on a regular basis. Physical life, you know, until we're about 30, you don't really have to pay too much attention to your body. It kind of takes care of itself. But after about 30... You know, oh, by the way, what you put in it, how you exercise <laughs> it has an impact on the rest of your life. So you have a physical life. So you need to spend some amount of time there. And then <clears throat> your emotional life is, number one, admitting you have them. So it is a <laughs> commonality that we all have. And I have numbers of people who say to me, with dead serious, oh, I, I, I don't have any. They're all gone. You know, I'm, I burned them all out 10 years ago. And I said, well, that's too bad because they're still in there haunting you. Right, so, right. Isn't, you know, it, isn't you, it interesting, your self-reflection on that, about your emotional life? I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing that your work, as you're going through the seven slices, there's a lot of self-reflection. 
you know, talking about, well, what is my emotional life? What is my physical life? And, and, and well, so on, right? Yeah, I've had, I don't know how many CEOs I would have said to me, well, David, I don't want to go to a therapist. And I go, I'm not asking you to go to a therapist. I'm asking you what you feel about a series of subjects I've got for you, like your job. Right. What do you mean, how do I feel? That's a, and I go, that's a problem. <laughs> you should know how you feel about this menu. How about, how do you feel about you, your life, your job, your family, your friends, your siblings? Give me a feeling. Give me a word. Oh, wow. This feels like therapy. <laughs> We've got a long Kind of sounds like therapy too, Dave, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, you know, the, the, the work I do was primarily around executive talent development work. The intellectual slice is critical because that's where your curiosity lies. Sure. And in talent development, you don't grow without curiosity. You can be told you have to grow, so you do it for a short period of time. So a lot of the work that I've done with people under stress is, hey, it's okay under stress to pursue things you're interested in. Right, right. Like a subject worth reading for 10 minutes a night before you go to bed. You know, That's, yeah, I, I love, you know, you're, you're bringing in some rituals here too about, you know, define what it is, go for it, you know, set aside that time. Your seventh slice is the spiritual one. And Adrian and I, as we've been doing more and more of these podcasts, this spirituality, particularly through COVID, seems to have spiked as well. Now, whether it's a part of a formal religion or it's meditation and so on. When you talk about this spiritual slice, I think Adrian and I would both be really interested in how do you address that? Because there's this one side of business that says the, you know, the two things you never talk about are politics and religion. Right. And yet it's getting safer to talk about spirituality. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally. And, you know, I'm, I don't think I violated any of those codes. But years ago, when I started this, when we'd go into that spiritual slice, I, I just asked, so what do you believe in? Mm. Outside of everything you see around us, outside of every tangible wall, chair, desk, what do you believe is actually going on? in the universe with you. Do you think there's something out there? Nothing out there? Are you here totally accidentally or an accident in the universe? Do you think you have a purpose? You know, where where is your spiritual uh, ability to get out of your moment and look at the world and universe with you a very small part in it? So what do you think? And this is where people would say, well, you know, I, I try to meditate. OK. And then other people would say, you know, I try to pray. I, it's hard. I used to go to a church service or belong to a church or whatever. I let that go. I've got kids now. I kind of wrestle with it. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it, as long as you don't ignore it, it has a real benefit. All the research and data shows <clears throat> in every survey, people who have a rich spiritual life, live longer, and have fewer health problems. And that's what I would say. That might be worth a try. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. You know, if you need a tangible reason why, because a lot of people want to wrestle with me, you know, or people like me, oh, are you going to talk about God now, Dave? And I go, well, whether you want to talk about God or not, whether you believe or not, is not that important to me. What I just want to know is, do you spend any time per week there? Because if you do, it will help you manage the stress in your work and at home, which is where all the tangible and intangible stresses are. And then they would sit back and look at me and go, well, you know what? You, you might have a point there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I love that. No, this has been really interesting, Dave, and I love the seven slices. Um, one of the things that you you write about, too, is that you, and, and we do this, I hear this over and over again, is that once we get through this crisis, I'll feel better then. Right. Um, and, and as you're saying, it never stops. The stress is not going to stop. So why is this a harmful attitude, and how can we break that if we do start feeling that? Well, in, in business, just to talk about 
on the business side of the ledger versus home for a moment. Uh, we now know the data is rich that when the work for, your workforce is stressed, they're less productive than when they're not. So this whole thing of I'll wait till this project gets done, the deadline's October 4th, and then I can relax. And then all of a sudden on October 4th, they push it out two weeks. And then what we saw was productivity went down again. So what I try to convince my clients is, can we just accept it's never going to stop? <laughs> and you and I cannot go up and down this roller coaster of life with it. Oh, I'm stressed. I can't be friendly, warm, nice, caring. You have to wait for me to get through my problem here. Can we just decide it's never going to change, but we will change how we go through it. So instead of going too high when we win or too low when we lose, we're going to try and stay right in the middle because that's what leaders do and that's what followers seek. They seek consistency, calmness, and assurity in crises, stress, and drama. And I have found in my client work Whenever, and I've got a client right now that's entertaining me wildly because every week there's a brand new drama. <laughs> every week, it's unbelievable. Last week was a potential whistleblower, okay? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And that's what I said to the CEO. I go, remember, this is not going to stop. Because he was going up and I go, we've got to just accept that what we disagree with in order to be willing to go into these seven slices to use them to mitigate the stress levels that get produced in our professional and family slices. I, this, this method has proven that's true. And I keep, you know, the, the culprit that stops people from doing it, of course, is time. Right. Dave, I don't have time. You don't understand. Uh, COVID, I'm working, the kids, the, my wife, the, my spouse, my partner. It's nonsense. I go, let me help you out. A 10-minute walk is 10 minutes. It's not 10 hours. It's not a week. It's a 10-minute walk with your spouse or partner or whatever. So you combine physical, personal, and family slice in 10 minutes. I promise you, you will feel better and balanced after a 10 minute walk versus not doing it and then letting the stress pile on you and then woe is me you got to pick up that fourth drink for the night to kind of get you to go to bed yeah i go this is this is a dead end this is not gonna work you've got to accept that you know i am such a fan of just go for a walk i uh, you know that, that you advise that is is so that really resonates with me because, you know, as things get stressed and, and, and to your point, it's 10 minutes. You can find 10 minutes. Anybody can find 10 minutes. Well, as we were putting together the runner show, Adrian graciously gave me the next segment because oh. he, you are an active tennis player. And I grew up in a tennis playing family. So before I get into my question, A, who's your favorite tennis player and what racket do you play with? Oh, so the racket is the Dunlop Zeron, I think. It's, it's the lightest racket made because I've had years of tennis elbows. So that's the racket. <laughs> Good choice. And then my favorite player of all time, not to date myself, but was John McEnroe. Really? The Mac Small attack. Day. Good for you. You can't yeah, be serious, totally. I think is what you, I mean. You cannot <laughs> yeah. be serious. You cannot be serious. Yeah. Talk about stressed out. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's really interesting, and we'll divert here just for a second for our listeners. But before they had Cyclops, before they had the, you know, you could challenge and see where it was. McEnroe, of course, would go crazy on the line calls. Well, a guy went back and looked at like the 100 calls that he complained about, and he was right 98% of the time. So, you know, he had reason. Talk about anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me not to scream and yell. I'm right. Um, right. Anyway, so um, what lessons from your background in sports do you bring to the idea of finding harmony, right, in, in, in our lives? Because, you know, sports, as we've just demonstrated, and with McEnroe, I can't believe you picked the most anxiety-ridden player probably of all time. Um, what, what, what kind of life lessons can you teach us from your, from your background in tennis and sports? Well, in tennis, I had a... I was always an okay 
athlete, you know, not great, but not bad. But I always played on teams that did really well, you know, <laughs> and through no fault of my own. I mean, I, I would contribute, but they we had great players and coaches and so forth. So what I learned, and it was beaten into me, you know, week after week in practices, I couldn't play tense. That I had to trust my practice routines in the matches or on the field in the sports, because I played a number of other sports besides tennis, did a lot of ice hockey. So in hockey, I just grew up with the coaches saying, just play. Don't think play. So a, a buddy, a friend of mine, you know, we, we've studied tennis players for years. <clears throat> and then a book was written about the top 100 tennis players way back in the Sampras era. Mm -hmm. And what they found, the only thing that separated the top uh, 10 for, out of the bottom 90, where, where the economic benefits were like stupendous, the difference between top 10 and like 25 in the world, was self-talk. Hmm. It was the only difference, which was a mental version, I think, of the seven slice method. In other words, it was if it was positive, reassuring, every top 10 player had it. And I'll never forget Pete Sampras's. His was all is well. Isn't that fascinating? So what, what they found physiologically was if the mind told the brain under stress, match point, I'm going to lose, whatever, all is well. That the body, muscles, tendons, ligaments relaxed so that the practice swing could could work under pressure because what they found with the bottom 90 is negative self-talk, upset, and so forth, and the muscles shrink a little bit, and then the ball doesn't hit the middle of the strings like the way it does in practice. But the anomaly to that, to go back to McEnroe, his, he was the only player whose level of play went up the more negative he thought. <laughs> so his, it tensed him up and he actually was more relaxed, angry. Yeah. So, but again, on the, in the method of, of we, we now know that we don't want you working under stress. So playing sports, we don't want you stressed out because, quote, the choker, you know, is the guy who can't handle the stress. But it's really not he can't handle it. It's just that his swing has just changed right. under pressure. Right. Great. Well, listen, um, Give us a, a place where we can find more about your work. I mean, if you want to send people to somewhere, where would you go? Yeah, go to the website. You know, it's www.peak, P-E-A-K-C-G, for Peak Consulting Group, peakcg.com. And it's got a lot of information on the kind of work and, and kind of clients that I have and so forth. And it's, uh, it's a myriad of things from executive talent development to conflict resolution. I do jury and trial consulting. For patent litigations, which talk about stress, you know, billions of dollars on the line, and these lawyers and executives are just fraught with peril. Um, and I do a lot of, you know, public speaking for keynote uh, corporations and so forth. So that's where they can go and, and learn a little bit. I've got a video on there so people can watch me walk around a room and give a talk. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, one of the things, uh, Dave, you, you've talked about is your, your own anxiety that you've worked through. Yeah. So we're always interested in, in rituals of self-care of successful people like yourself. So talk about what you do each day or each week to, to really maintain your mental health with as busy as you are. Yeah, it, it's a um, great question. So, <clears throat> you know, am I drinking my own Kool-Aid kind of thing? Right. So uh, I'm, I'm one of these process guys. So everybody's different. So for me... I need to plan it. So every week I schedule these things. So I schedule exercise in the form of tennis two to three times a week. I read two books a month, uh, 20 minute chunks, three nights a week, and then a, an hour or so on the weekend. And I manage to plow through two books uh, a month doing that way. I have, my faith is important to me, so I spend time there each week on a virtual church service and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I write 
that's my personal life, you know, is, is writing. And I've got a couple more books that I'm writing right now. So I carve out time each week to do that. Otherwise, I can assure you, you'll never finish a book. You can start 100, but if you don't have a schedule, they never somehow get finished. Um, and so for me, you know, when I talk with associates and friends about, geez, you know, what's going on and, you know, how are you handling this and how are you handling your kids and this, that and the other thing. So I've got probably two or three friends I do that with once, two or three times a quarter kind of thing. So what happens is the stress level, which is moves around in my life, up, sometimes down, I think, at least I appear or and feel like I'm handling it okay. Now, I get really run down at times and I feel a sense of burnout at times. And when that occurs, because the work generally or a family issue comes up that's difficult, I generally feel I have to lean on one of those five slices a little bit more. So I might play an, an extra match of tennis or I might read a little bit more. I, I, I try and spend time that way. But I have found that works for me. But I've known other clients who do it differently, who, who t take it a week at a time. Well, this week I'm, I'm going to be leaning into my spiritual life. Uh, next week I'm leaning into my intellectual life. So they do it a week or a day or something at a time. So we're all, we all have our own different uh, preference. But the, the problem I have seen is people who pick it up and put it down, pick it up and put it down. Because a lot of us are achievers, you know, and the big thing with achievers is once I've achieved it, I want to move on to the next one. Right. And I have found when this method works, it's long term, consistent, repetitive, sustainable behavior in these five other slices, you will be a better person eventually by investing this amount of effort and time into you. It really is about discipline, isn't it? Like you say, scheduling yeah. that time. Make sure that you stick to the schedule. You know, it, it's a lot like, you know, dieting, right? When you're up and down and, you know, your weight is up and down. It's the consistency that brings real satisfaction and joy. Hey, Dave, this has been a great discussion. You've shared so many wonderful things with us. Uh, if there were two things you wanted uh, our listeners to take away from the conversation, if you could, you know, homogenize it down to just two yeah. key takeaways, what would those be? The what first takeaway is what I just said. It, it, it's a method that enough people have used and tried that we know it works long term. So this is something that works, number one. Number two, the result, the byproduct of this beyond managing stress is an incredible introspective look into you. Spending these minutes per week on you in your life, in these other slices, you learn stuff about yourself. I, I honestly don't know where else you would learn it, particularly as a busy adults, where busyness versus productivity is always a challenge. This is very productive if you're really interested in learning why you do what you do and the way you do it. Excellent. So those are two takeaways. Well, listen, this has been a great conversation. We've been talking with Dave McNeff. He is the author of The Work-Life Balance Myth, and he shared a lot of wisdom with us today. Thank you so much for being on the show, Dave. Hey, listen, guys, thank you very much. This is great. I enjoyed it. The questions were fantastic, and uh, appreciate it very much. Well, just some great insights from David McNeff. I I, I love the uh, kind of the thoughts as we began on the way, unfortunately, so many of us are coping. Our coping mechanisms are bad. And sometimes we think, oh, it's, as you said, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But it's not. Uh, so many of us are doing other things to, to somehow cope with everything that's going on. And we need to step back and realize these coping mechanisms are harming more than helping. Yeah, yeah. Although, you know, that cake method really resonated with me. <laughs> I, just I had three slices of cake during this podcast alone. So I mean, cake cake for breakfast works for me. I um, I love the seven slices, the way he divvied it up, you know, and I think yeah. he went a little deeper. We've had other 
people come on the on the podcast and say, well, you know, there's four, there's five. I mean, make up your own slices. I, I love that. He says, but the intellectual slice, be sure that you're, that's where your curiosity lies. I, that really mm-hmm. hit me that, yeah, be be curious, you know, like you said, yeah. find a book and read it for 10 minutes before the, before you go to bed. Something that will stimulate your curiosity. What, what, what are you curious about these days, Adrian? Yeah, you know, this was interesting because I, I just got off a coaching call with one of the CEOs that, that I'm working with. And as we went through, he, he worries about so everybody else. I mean, he's, you know, three kids and his, his spouse and his, and his company. And I said, t- to walk me through your routine, and, and it was pretty clear after a while the one thing he was missing in his life was any form of exercise, and he missed that. And my challenge to him was to, I said, okay, uh, I want you to find two times a week where you can exercise for, even if it's half an hour. Uh, it's just what we were talking about with the walk. But he was missing not only his physical, but his personal aspect as well, that he wasn't taking any time for himself because he's such a giver. Yeah, and it is so easy to just to stay at your desk and keep working or stay in front of your computer and you know, that's why I I love and hate my Apple Watch because it pings me. They stand up for a few, you know, even just for a few minutes uh, every hour. I'll tell you the thing, the slice that I'm always very curious about is spiritual. You know, like you say, it's a, it can be a bit of a landmine to talk about religion. And he said, look, I just want to know, what do you believe in? Are you an accident? Where do you fit into the universe? Mm-hmm. And then they said, oh, you, you know, you're going to start preaching to me? And he says, look, studies have showed, I, I love his answer, studies shows that spiritual people, are happier and live longer. So you should probably look into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then he moved on to this idea that we got to accept crises are never going to be over. And we do this. We, we see this every time we coach somebody. The next week or the next two weeks we're with them, they say, oh, yeah, no, but now we're dealing with this or that. It never stops. And we do this in our personal lives. Oh, when I finally get the kids back to school, I'll be able to... Co-. No, it never stops. So we have to accept that... It's not going to stop. And I love this. He said, too, we have to accept people we don't agree with. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But we can still be friendly, warm, and caring. I love that. Yeah, I, I'm thinking, you know, he's my executive coach, and he says, Chester, it's never going to stop. It's never going to end. I go, really? Is that the advice I was looking for? <laughs> you know, yeah. lastly, to wrap up, I love the yeah. self-talk. You know, of course, you know, when you brought it back to tennis, I thought that was fabulous that the only tennis player in the top 100 that ever, you know, got better mm. the more he screamed and yelled was John McEnroe. I guess there's always an outlier, right? This idea, though, that all is well, that you can't play tense. Just such right. great advice. To, you know, our, our, yeah. our friend Gary Ridge who at, at WD-40, he always says, it's all going to work out. Don't worry, it's all going to work out. And, and we studied Michael Phelps, if you remember, for All In, our book All In on culture. That's right. and, and the big difference, I mean, there's other tall, lanky guys built like Michael Phelps. Yeah, he's supremely talented. But if you look on the starting blocks of the finals of the 100, they all look like Michael Phelps. <laughs> and so what was the difference is psychologists have found, yeah, the difference in Michael Phelps is that when he stood in those blocks, he didn't just think he could win. He knew he was going to win. Uh, and, and there was a difference in that belief, that idea of that mental strength that we have to, to have, that, you know, whether it's all is well or Michael Phelps. No, I'm going to win. <laughs> yeah. I, I used yeah. to love it when people would try to stare him down. I said, that's a big mistake. <laughs> if I were you, I, I would not make eye contact at all. I would just go swim. Well, listen, uh, a lot of fun. I mean, a lot of great advice. We hope it's uh, helping you deal with your anxiety at work and, and hopefully brought a little joy, a little happiness into your days. Well, we sure appreciate you taking the time to tune in. And a special thanks to our producer, Brent Klein, out of Austin, Texas, to Christy Lawrence in Atlanta, Georgia, who helps find these amazing guests and of course to all of you who are listening we want to thank our sponsor life guides a peer-to-peer community that helps people navigate through their day-to-day stressors by providing a place of empathy listening wisdom and support and again please go to lifeguides.com slash slash schedule a demo and add the code healthy 2021 and you get two months of free service can't beat that with a stick can you just <laughs> not that you would because you're no, nice yeah no. uh, also a big uh, shout out to go happy hub the most inclusive and timely way to communicate and engage directly with your frontline employees you know they have a 95 percent open rate so with go happy hub you can text messages directly from corporate enable permissions Give your frontline leaders a little thank you, logistic updates, LTOs. I mean, if you need to communicate something to your frontline workers, Go Happy Hub 
is the way to do it. The feedback and whatnot on Go Happy Hub is phenomenal. We love the culture they're building there too. Sean Boyer, the CEO there, you know, good guy, good company, great service, and we're really thankful for their sponsorship. We do. We like to work with people who are good people that we like. So, so thank you for all of you for joining in. If you like the podcast, check out the book, Anxiety at Work from Harper Collins. And we want to thank you, all of you who listened, who download and share this message. Take care and be well. See you next week.